All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending our session today. Uh, my name is Taylor Barkley, and I am a program officer for the technology and innovation team at the Charles Koch Institute. And uh, we at the Charles Koch Institute, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that runs internships, professional development programs, and focuses on key issues that are important to society, um, including technology and innovation. And the team I work on there, we believe that technology has been a force for good throughout human history, improving everyone's lives uh, since we have started inventing and innovating things as a human species. And uh, we need a culture, and to, quick, to keep those gains going, we need a culture that's friendly towards innovation. And that requires having bottom-up solutions. So that's why I'm excited to moderate today's panel with folks who are on the front line providing these solutions to parents, to kids, grandparents, caregivers, everyone in between for uh, them to be safe online uh, using important products. So I'm just going to make introductions brief for our panel before we get start discussion today. I'm going to go alphabetically by last name, and if you can wave as I introduce you, uh, that would be great. Uh, first, we have Tony Anscombe, uh, is the Chief Security Evangelist at ESET. Next, we have Dr. Alicia Blum-Ross, who is the Global Public Policy Lead for Kids and Family at Google. Next, we have Caroline Curtin, a Director on the U.S. Government Affairs Team at Microsoft. Next, we have Brent Irvin, who is the Vice President and General Counsel at Tencent America. And finally, Lexi Peskin, who is the Senior Counsel and VP of Safety at the Meet Group. So for our first question, I would love uh, for all of you to take turns answering it. Um, it's one for everyone. Maybe we'll start with uh, Lexi first. <laughs> we'll go the opposite direction. Um, good. Change it up a bit, maybe from what I originally outlined. But uh, familiarize, I would like everyone to familiarize the audience with the products and services your companies provide where issues of safety online are most relevant. And then tell us about a recent safety feature or development at your company that you are excited about. So we want to know what you're doing and what you're excited about. <laughs> Okay, so uh, for a little bit of background for those who don't know, in the Meet Group we run, um, we manage a portfolio of dating apps and um, or social discovery apps, and um, that also uh, with the live streaming service as part of it, uh, which has been a very large um, part of our um, services for the last couple of years since we launched. Um, and um, so, obviously, safety is a concern. We're online. We're bringing people together. Um, we also are 18 plus. We're always um, trying to make sure that we're not having underage people on our apps as um, and our websites, even though apps is much much larger a portion of our market these days. Um, <clears throat> and let's see, we have a couple of we always have different safety safety initiatives um, going on. One that has been. Um, very exciting recently is we are trying to use, um, we're using a product called FaceTech, um, which is taking um, screenshots of a person, basically trying to check to make sure that the people who are using our apps are actually live humans and the humans that they they say they are going, they are, you know, so if you're on as a woman of a certain age, you're not gonna, you're, you're not, <laughs> we'll verify that. Mm. So um, that's, that's a really exciting product. Um, you know, we've, we've, had some success with that um in terms of um being able to stop scam activity so that's great very helpful brent um so i mean tencent does a a, a lot of things um i won't get into all of them i think you know, just for the sake of time i was going to talk mostly about uh you know, video games uh, since we're one of the bigger uh, video game companies in the world um you know there's the Based out of Asia, there, there, there are differences, there are regulatory differences, there are societal differences, how they view video games. But, you know, one thing that, and, you know, we've always tried to do is, you know, look, we talked about this before. I'm not, I'm pretty, I'm a gamer. Um, you know, my eight-year-old daughter is playing Minecraft. I, I have nothing against games. I think they're great. Um, but I think like anything, you know, within reason, right? And, um, you know, one of the things that we've right, tried to do over the last few years in particular is roll out, I, I think, uh, you know, sort of best in class, robust set of tools um, that are, some some of it are, I, I guess, would be more like rules that apply to minors when they play, there are limits on time and money they can spend, things like that. But there's a, 
a robust set of tools that parents can use to monitor game time, to set additional limits, when they can play, when they can't, how much they can spend, things like that. Um, and I think we've done, uh, you know, a really good job over the last, you know, at this point, it's pretty much 99, you know, we, we had to go back and apply to games, but we're at about 99% of our sort of online, you know, our, our game uh, offer this service now. Um, and, it, and it's worked, uh, you know, quite well. In my opinion. That's great. Very helpful. What are some games uh, we may have heard of? So, uh, I mean, the the games, there are some unique facts. Sometimes they have, there's a Chinese version of the game, but, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, translating into English and, and, you know, so PUBG is a popular game, Call of Duty, uh, Mobile, um, the, you know, those would be the, the ones that uh, at least some people in this audience might have, might have heard of. Great, that's helpful. Thanks for sharing, Caroline. Of legends, anyways. Yeah, there's a bunch. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks, Brent. <laughs> oh, thanks, Taylor. Um, so, well, Microsoft does have a range of products and devices and services. Um, some of them may sound more familiar than others, but we are a cloud computing company these days. Um, we have a search engine called Bing. We have a professional networking site called LinkedIn and um, a computer called Surface. Uh, but in addition, we have uh, Xbox, and that's what I'll focus on mostly today, um, especially as I think about um, one of the products that we're most excited about um, in the safety space, and, and that is earlier this year in September, we launched um, a new app. It's called the Xbox Family Settings app. Um, and it's available on iOS and Android devices. It's, it's free. Um, it's just a super convenient way for parents to be able to set up a child account. You can do it in under two minutes. Um, control um, the amount of time your child is gaming and when they're gaming. If, if you don't want them to be gaming um, during the school day, especially as so many kids are now virtual, um, you can control that. Um, and set it up for the weekends, uh, make it a reward if you'd like. You can control content based on the ESRB ratings. Um, you can get a daily or a weekly activity report right on your phone um, to just get quick insights into how your child is gaming. And then you can also um, control their friends. So you can either um, allow or block um, friends and you can get an ask a parent. So if a child can actually push you a request on your phone in real time and say, I'd like to add this gamer uh, to my friends list. And you can get a quick look at that gamer's profile and have a conversation with your child about who that friend is. Um, so we're just uh, super excited about that particular app because we all have our phones attached to us 24 seven, it feels like. Um, and not everybody's comfortable with the controller and setting controls through the controller. So we just wanted to make it super easy. That's great, that's great. Alicia? Um, so Google, probably you're familiar with some of our bigger products like Google Search and YouTube, but we also have a lot of specific products um, and indeed policies that sit behind all of our products um, specifically developed for kids and families. So um, ultimately, we believe, of course, that technology can support learning young people's expression, their connections to their peers and family. And obviously, this year has highlighted the importance of all of that. We also have a pretty extensive program in place to mitigate risk and potential abuse um, directed towards children um, across our services. So thinking first about the products that we put in place, some of you may be familiar with Google Family Link, which is our supervised account experience. And so it's a, um, I thought that was a great insight in the panel earlier this morning. It's an online safety experience, not a parental control, although I think mm. parents might think of it as both. Um, and that allows you to create a kind of a supervised experience across um, Google products and services and really try to create, at least within the kind of Google world, that one-stop shop that um, obviously is so crucially important to parents. We also have YouTube Kids, which provides a more contained experience um, for kids to experience their favorite um, video experiences and, and you know, hopefully learn and experience a lot of what YouTube can offer. And that was also highlighted earlier. In terms of new things, and we have been trying to show up for families in myriad ways during COVID-19 in particular. 
um, whether that's been through the expansion of free and reduced cost access to things like Google for Education, and we now have you know, G Suite for Education. We now have over 140 million um, student and educator users around the world and have been trying to show up for school districts and you know, religious institutions and all kinds of learning institutions that are you know, um, really important in kids' lives. We also have tried to make life a little bit easier for parents by launching new, for example, in May, we launched um, a new teacher approved program in the Google Play Store. So that's actually uh, apps that have all been reviewed uh, based on an assessment criteria developed with experts from Harvard and Georgetown. And they're all reviewed by teachers. So they're not necessarily all learning apps. Some of them are just really fun um, games, but they are really kind of reviewed for like that kind of high quality content in mind. And then also our new Google Kids space. So the idea is really both creating kind of infrastructure and education <laughs> but also access to great quality content, things like Camp YouTube, you know, it was like friendship bracelets and STEM learning for all the kids that had to miss out on a lot of summer yeah. experience this year. So it's been a really, really busy year um, and, you know, really kind of proud that hopefully we've been able to support families in this time. That's great. Thanks, Alicia. Tony? Hi, thank you, Taylor. So ESET is a cybersecurity company uh, based out of Europe. We've got offices all over the world and we're, we're the guys that look for the malware and the bad guys on the internet and protect you on, on the device. So all the way from an enterprise product where you may be doing threat intelligence, where you've got a security team and actually looking at advanced threats that might be uh, looking at corporate. But today, our focus is down on, I think, more on the family and the consumer. Mm. Yeah, we go all the way down to what most of us would term antivirus products. Uh, it's a little bit broader than that these days because you know we get involved in protecting the iot devices on your home network whether it's a tv whether it's you know looking at vulnerabilities etc in the different devices and how, how to how to protect them we also have a parental control product in fact i liked somebody else's comment there it wasn't a parental control product i, I forget what you just called it but I, I like the other words for it um that's that's kind of cool uh and that's that's one one part of it, but technology can only protect to a certain level. Uh, and we've one thing I'm excited about is we've just released Safer Kids Online, so mm. a website with parental guidance and parental help on it, where parents can go and, and get advice on cybersecurity and privacy issues, which I think is super important because, as we all know, technology can protect in a certain way, but unfortunately, it's human behaviour that's the piece that typically puts us all at risk. Right. That's an important point, which I hope we can all get to later. I know I enjoyed that discussion with you all earlier on. So in light of this report that FOSI released today at the, the conference, how do you, you all and your companies think through making uh, people aware of these safety products and services? How do, you, how do you let them know the tools that are out there? Whoever would like to answer that question, we can maybe have a few different answers. Yeah, Carolyn. Um, oh, yeah. So thanks, Taylor. Um, it, it's obviously so important. You you can create the what you hope are the best tools in the world, but if folks don't know about them, um, it's a bit of a non-starter. Um, so we try to do a number of things. Uh, one thing we're doing with our two new consoles that we just uh, announced and released uh, earlier this month is um, we're partnering with retailers um, so that at the point of sale, there's actually um, a trifold brochure for parents that actually tells them about the online safety tools available in the, in the Xbox console and encourages them to set them up. And it also mentions the new family settings app. Um, and we also provide training for the employees at those retail organizations about our safety tools so that um, as parents are looking at the new consoles, there's someone there who can actually speak to the safety offerings. Um, and then uh, we have uh, videos, short videos, because we know everyone is super uh, busy, um, that just explain um, how to use our controls. And we have a website, um, which is on xbox.com, under responsible gaming as well. So 
Um, and we partner with others like the ESRB, um, who has a, they have a wonderful website called parentaltools.org, which um, puts all the different tools and websites that different uh, gaming companies and console makers offer. So it's a bit of that one-stop shop that we heard uh, this morning from the research that, that parents want so much. If I could just add a couple further thoughts, and I think that I absolutely agree with everything that Caroline said. You know, we need to show up kind of where people are, right, rather than expecting them to find tools. And, and to that end, we've actually tried to also create more tools that are sort of out of the box experiences. So mm -hmm. Family Link now comes pre-installed on, on operating systems from Android Q and beyond. And the idea there is like really just make it as easy as possible for parents to get up and running um, with these tools, recognizing that, you know, putting in place supervision is hard emotionally and also sometimes technically, although encouraged by some of the data that, you know, parents may be getting more savvy and higher expectations about some of the tools. Um, I think also some of our partnerships have been really key to getting the word out as well. So we have some longstanding partnerships um, with organizations like FOSI, but also the National PTA and others where, for example, with our Be Internet Awesome educational outreach program, you know, we've been working in schools and the idea there is to create both resources for children themselves to experience, but also surround it with resources for parents. And we ran a really successful program with the PTA to um, invite local PTA chapters to kind of apply to, and they would get a grant and a Google Chromebook to be able to run school assemblies, um, for, sorry, assemblies for parents um, and for children using the Be Internet Awesome resources, which then also has some signposting, not just to our own resources, but to others as well. That's great. Would uh, someone like to add one more thought on this question? Yeah, I, what was yeah. interesting was, was the age down of, of how I think the, the the older parents and the younger parents different differing view on you know what on who's responsible actually for teaching child child safety. Now those younger parents rely on the education system. It's a community approach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that's super interesting. But um, you know, one, one thing we I think. Is, is in all parents is this is an awkward topic yeah parents avoid having the the online safety discussion with their kids to a certain degree and i think that that's one of the engaging things we need to get over so i like to hear you know google and microsoft saying put all those resources and likewise he said you just put up this website but the problem is is the 80 percent of parents that you need to look at it don't it, yeah, you're getting the 20 percent, and it's how we go and engage as an industry with that the other 80%, I think, is the real big question for me. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I can add up just quickly. Uh, um, yeah, go because ahead. Because it's slightly, you know, because it's, you know, so like in China or India more recently, some of the things that uh, are, are actually sort of baked into the game. So in China, it's real name registration. And if you're a minor, um, you, you, you know, you're, you're registering as a minor. And so there are limits on your time that you can play. Um, there's a curfew essentially that you can't play at certain times at night. Uh, I think it's 10 p.m. But and then there's also limits on on, on payment, and that that's baked into the game. So you know, unless you're uh, over 18, you're going to face restrictions in terms of what you can do. Now, we had when I talked about you know we had in fact put some of those things in place um, prior to the actual regulatory requirement, um, trying to to get ahead of the curve and, and, and create a good atmosphere for gameplay, but. But in some ways, you can, you know, at least in uh, in Asia in particular, I think you're seeing that these things are becoming requirements that get baked into the games. Interesting. It's a requirement from the government or local authorities. Yeah. So in India, they, you know, Métis is the main regulator, and they required uh, they required some games to to put in uh, these things. It's not systematic in China. Like again, we had put a lot of these things in place years before, but over time. Sure. Um, the regulations sort of codified, I guess, what, what, what we had been doing. And so, yeah, now it's baked into the game. Uh, and then the parental controls, you just, like everyone else, you try to get the word out. You know, it's, to us, it's, it's baked into to WeChat, and it's, there's, there, there's, there's like a mini app within, uh, a mini program within WeChat that you can use to do all this. And there's kind of, put, you know, efforts to market to parents and things like that. Gotcha. That's really interesting. Uh, Lexi, I'd like to come to you with a, another question that maybe uh, someone else can chime in after uh, we hear your answer. But can you tell us about the impact of new technology on safety and how you build safety into products that bring online communities together? Sure. I mean, we have um, 
been basically from the beginning of our company um, very invested in safety. Um, and in fact, I think it's, um, I, I don't have the exact percentage, but it's about over 40% of our workforce is dedicated to user safety um, and moderation of our um, apps. And what, so we are always trying to figure out um, new and innovative ways um, using machine learning um, and algorithms to try to um, figure out you to, to try to stop um, you know, mostly, you know, we're a little bit different than other companies um, on this panel in that we are, we are, we don't want miners on our apps at all. Um, <laughs> it's not that we're trying to make them safe for miners. We just don't, you know, the best way to make them safe for miners is not to have them um, sure. you know, on the apps. And that's, so it's a, it's a little, we're, we're really looking to keep them off and delete those accounts and to make sure that we're not allowing that device to re-register or that email address or any of that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different. And we're also looking for um, often, you know, grooming behavior. Um, I know um, we had, we had, we had contributed um, to uh, Project Artemis, which was not our project, but we've we um, contributed lines of code to try to do that, and we've been we've had we've been able to implement it on one of our apps with some success. Um, you know, we hope to be able to um, to continue with that. Um, and there's uh, we also are trying to use um, an AWS machine learning in uh, order to do age verification um, for all profile pictures. Um, and it will be anything something uh, anything that gets flagged by that will be t one of our safety team will review it, do a holistic review of the profile and determine whether it's something. So we're those are just a couple of the things we've been trying now. We, but we've always this has been a constant thing throughout our entire history. That's real. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, Caroline, please. I was just going to add on to um, what what Lexi and Alicia said. Just to to say one of the things that I think is most encouraging is that. Um, it seems as though digital safety um, is not something that any of us is looking to be competitive on. Um, we're not seeing it as a competitive differentiator. Um, I feel as though we are collaborating today more than we ever have before. Um, and we're all better for it, and our customers are better for it, our families are better for it. And I just I think that's so encouraging. I think back to what Lexi said about Project Artemis, which came out of um, a, what we call a 360 hackathon on our Redmond campus, um, where uh, companies came together and NGOs, and um, we started to work on what became this anti-grooming uh, technique, um, which we then gave to Thorn, and it's offered for free to, to anyone who would uh, like to use it. Um, and with Google, um, you know, back in the spring when we were all in the beginning throes of the pandemic, um, you know, we partnered on the Stay Safe, Stay Online um, educational initiative, um, and others joined us in that, like Facebook um, and, and so many others. But I just think that it's so encouraging that we're not competing on this, and also that digital safety really is becoming a professional discipline, almost like privacy and cybersecurity are. Um, and we're just, we're all building our muscle every day in that, and that's super important. Those are great points. Um, and Lexi, and I think, you know, Caroline, you mentioned the use of AI and machine learning uh, in promoting safety with your products. Alicia, do you want to talk about how you've seen AI and machine learning deployed to help people stay safe online? I mean, absolutely. There's so many ways in which machine learning and, um, and AI can help us both in terms of finding content that is abusive and has already been shared and finding it reshares of that content more quickly with you know a process we call hash matching um obviously photo dna developed by microsoft initially but also youtube engineers have developed a, a sort of a, a newer version that looks at um, hash matching in video content and we make that freely available to other companies and then in the last couple of years we actually also worked to develop new classifiers which can help identify never before seen imagery and particularly child sexual abuse and exploitation. So we offer that as a program called the Content Safety API, and that's available to other companies. And basically it helps um, give them a score so that they're able to sort of see content that is very likely to be CCM versus content that's very unlikely to be CCM. 
and they must still review that content and make their own determination of whether or not that that's the correct assessment. But it allows those teams to get to the highest likely content much more quickly. And in this case, because it's never before identified material, that may is much more likely to be a situation where there may be a child being currently abused. And so that allows those companies to be able to prioritize those reports, be able to send those to NCMEC, who, as you know, send those to law enforcement around the world. And also just to say, and really echoing Caroline's point about, you know, this area around child sexual abuse and exploitation is absolutely an area where our work across industries is, is so crucially aligned. And that has been a really big focus this year in the work that we've done to kind of, you know, really reinvigorate and up-level the work of the Technology Coalition, which some of you may know is our kind of industry-wide effort to really focus our fight um, against child sexual abuse and exploitation. So in June, we announced Project Protect, which is our kind of five pillar plan to really um, attack this problem head on, work in lockstep across industry on these issues. Because again, um, these are steps that we all voluntarily take to try to eradicate this abuse from our platforms. But really we need to work with experts um, across the industry, across, you know, across the world to understand both, um, you know, how we can reach those who may be at risk of offending, how we can reach children who may not understand the context of, you know, how and what they're sharing. Um, so really this has been a great um, and I think important step forward for us as an industry and just really doubling down our efforts in this space. That's great. Brent or Tony, do you have thoughts on or be stories to share about the use of AI and machine learning? Well, we use we have been using machine learning for much longer than I think most of the industry consider in yeah. cybersecurity. Machine learning has been there for the last 15 to 20 years because to keep pace with cyber criminals that are writing malware, you know, companies like ours had to switch to machine learning early on. We just didn't brag about it 15 years ago because we didn't think people would understand it. Of course, today it's fairly normal for everybody to be talking about it. And how does the, how does that protect kids online? Well, of course, one big issue that kids and, and this takes kind of a different angle on it is identity theft. You know, cyber criminals will steal people's identities. They will steal yours and mine, but they'll also steal your kids because they can apply for a driver's right. license with your kid's ID. They can they can go and abuse their credit score before they've even become eighteen and and are thinking about things like that. So actually you know stopping the malware and stopping the bad cyber criminals and the bad actors out there early on with things like ai and machine learning and, and anti-malware stuff is super important it's just a different angle on child safety online gotcha brent did you have any thoughts you wanted to add to this topic of um, ai machine learning you know i think not a lot. I would simply say that, you know, a lot depends on what product you're talking about different, you know, so anything with UGC is going to create a whole uh, different range of, of issues that you know, technology can come to, to bear upon. If you're talking, since I've kind of, you know, limiting myself to mostly talking about games, uh, you know, there, it's just different, right? There, if there's no UGC, then you're, and, and, and you're in a context mm -hmm. where it's, you know, it, it's real name registration, then your, your, your use of technology is different, right? There's, you 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 have some interest in maybe I think if people you know that maybe there's some some facial recognition there's some way to verify that's actually you know the person is in fact who they are they are you know um, that you can't use somebody else's account to to you know an adult's account to play the game um, there could be pretty simple stuff in terms of the chats you know in terms of you know you, you say certain things that are, are just deemed you know bullying or or just inappropriate at whatever level those can just get automatically blocked uh, but I I would say it's not. Different products have, you know, different technical needs, I would say. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, glad you highlighted that point. You know, one thing, sure. oh, Caroline, did you have a thought? Yes. I'm sorry, I, would, I was just gonna add a couple things. Sure. Um, and back onto the collaboration again, just with all of the promise of AI and machine learning, the, the amount of data that is required to really train these text classifiers and these image classifiers um, so that you get the accuracy that we're all striving for is just mind boggling. Um, and, and therefore it is just even more important in this world of AI and machine learning that we are, we are sharing and we are collaborating. And then the other thing um, to mention is just along with the promise of AI and machine learning is just with any of these technologies, um, humans are still 
at the core of it um, because so much of it has to do with the context of the conduct um, or the content. And so that judgment um, that comes into play um, will always be imperative. So it's not as though we're gonna get to a day, at least in my view, where we don't need humans anymore. Um, and I just wanted to reflect that point in. That's an important point. Yep, humans are there, these tools are improving, but they're not the silver bullet solution uh, by any means. So one thing that you all have hit on in your introductions and through this discussion are different products and services that maybe are meant for younger audiences or older audiences. How do you go about verifying users and ages and making sure that the right people are using the right product and that you know maybe a predator isn't involved in a product meant for children or you know even vice versa? And Alexi, you mentioned. Uh, an image recognition tool that your your company yeah, started. So, so that's one is that one way you started, think about it? Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm going. Go ahead, finish. <laughs> no, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. I was just wanting to let okay, I want to hear no, you talk more. We just started using that as as another tool in our arsenal. We've always um, tried to focus on that. A lot of um, you know, earlier we've done a lot more um AI that would, you know, would go through go through chats that users are sending um or to look for key phrases that might indicate somebody is underage or, um, and as one of the, you know, one of the reasons we, we, we had a lot of chats that we could contribute to Project Artemis to kind of get that grooming machine learning, you know, because as, as Carolyn said, you need an enormous amount of data to be able to teach the machines. So, you know, we were able to contribute ours and many other companies did. Um, you know, part of that is we have, you know, we we see the patterns. We've worked um, very closely with Nick Mick over the years um, to try to also work on some projects. But we, you know, whenever we get those types of reports that it appears that there's some something, um, <clears throat> that there's somebody underage that that we're going to make sure that that person's on. If there's any, like there could have been a meetup, um, we're going to report that to the proper authorities, usually through Nick Mick. So um, to make sure that everybody's safe. And um, but yeah, we are we keep looking at new technologies and some of the age verification. There's a lot of new age verification technologies out there. Um, unfortunately, at the beginning, we have to rely on people giving us their correct date of birth. <laughs> um, but sure. there are we're, we're looking for other ways of, um, you know, working with that. Uh, obviously, we don't really care about a 50 year old lying about being 40, but we do care about a 13 year old lying about being 40. So, <laughs> yeah. so. <laughs> so. Any other thoughts on challenges and opportunities on, you know, making sure it's age appropriate use of these products and services? Sure, I, I think, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, please go ahead. Go ahead, Alicia. I think the debate around age verification is obviously a really live space right now. And I think that, um, you know, it, there's a lot of, I think, understandable um, motivation behind some of those questions, but there's also a lot of potential downstream impacts in terms of privacy, in terms of potential cutting off of access to services that users may rely on. So for example, um, mm. low income populations are more likely to be unbanked and may not have access to things like credit cards in order to be able to access some of the age verification flows. So certainly it's right. really fast evolving space right now. Um, you know, we, we as an industry have to balance like the privacy needs that you know the privacy motivation behind age verification with the, with the data that would need to be collected about a user you know some users really just do not want to be uploading ids let alone whether or not they may be undocumented and may not have access to them and you know how are, how are we going to deal with the equity issues that are raised by that so i don't think there's a lot of really easy answers here certainly it's something that we you know, think about and we do, you know, take steps. So for example, on YouTube, we remove tens of thousands of underage accounts every week. Um, so it is a space that we're really active in trying to get people in the right experience. And obviously, one of the ways that we can do that is offering tools for families that actually work and work easily so that they can help guide mm -hmm. kids' experiences and, and make sure that they are in the right state. Um, but I think this is, you know, certainly a space I think that's going to be evolving a lot in the next couple of years. Brent, did you have some thoughts you wanted to share on this point? Um, I, I think a little 
building off what Alicia said, I mean, they're trade-offs, right? And different different countries, different cultures are gonna are, are gonna see those trade-offs differently. Um, you know, the the easiest way to verify this is if you have real name registration with a national ID, um, and that that is the case in China. And so there's still some room to 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 to, to game that. Um, you know, you can have people using their parents' accounts. There's a bit of a market in, in sort of, you know, you know, once the rules came and there was a bit of a market, you know, you could try to get, you know, a, a adult, mm -hmm. adult, you know, over 18 ID game ideas on Taobao or something like that. But, you know, overall, that's going to be a pretty effective way. Uh, it, you know, not all societies, not all countries are going to, you know, they're going to have other issues and concerns. Uh, in India, so for example, it's not real name, but you know, so we've had to, you know, we're making it up, you know, we're trying the best we can, you know, we turn off, you do things, you can turn off, you know, guest login on Android, you know, uh, you can, uh, we've, we've, ex the idea that at least with the youngest players, uh, they're not going to have a cell phone, especially in India, uh, you know, you require like a one time over the top, you know, log, you know, cell phone number where they have to, you know, sort of you know, that type of authentication. Um, and that has you know some impact, but you know there's going to there's going to be trade offs, and it's going to be based on each country is going to have its own sort of baseline at which you try to figure out what works best. That's helpful. Tony and Caroline, I want to give you a chance to answer this question if you'd like. Well, I'd, I'd just like to pick up on something Brent said there, which I think is a super interesting one, isn't it? Is digital IDs or, or some form of national identity. I mean, certain countries will stand back and turn and say, well, that's a, that's a freedom and privacy issue. Mm -hmm. um, how, however, when we start to think about what we see in the media continually about identity theft or voting fraud, which is a kind of topical subject in, in some countries, isn't it? We look at, country, you know, look at a country like Estonia, where there is a digital ID system and it's technology based. Uh, through digital certificates, actually, it works pretty well, and you could you could look at how they've implemented it in their society, and I think, you know, it it could definitely be used as a blueprint. You know, and, and we kind of veer away from it. I'm based in the U.S., and, and everybody says, no, 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 we don't want a national ID card. Well, you've already got one. It's your social security number. It's your driver's license. It's in your pocket. It's just, you know, if it if it would give us that safety online and keep our kids safer online, wouldn't it be a good thing to have? Hmm. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Tony. All right. Well, uh, I wanted to come back to you know the point you raised earlier, Tony. Uh, maybe we can start with Caroline and then go to Alicia on this issue of uh, polymedia and kind of the the blurred line between maybe uh, technology tools to promote safety, but then you know the human element. So. Adults, kids, we're all using multiple platforms, multiple devices, uh, multiple services, and you know, one kind of overarching maybe system or software. Maybe we could get to a world where it hits all the electronic digital device devices, but then we're still going to have uh, you know maybe, maybe basic common sense or family situations. So, Caroline, Alicia, and then we'll open up to everyone else. If you want to talk a bit about those issues, uh, like kind of the polymedia and kind of that blurred line between technical solutions, but then also maybe the, the soft, <laughs> soft skills and solutions for safety. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, I'm certainly living it in our household right now with two children, um, virtual schoolers, and, and we're doing uh, remote work, of course. Um, and my son is using a Google Chromebook and doing a Google Classroom every day. Um, and my daughter's on Zoom calls. And I'm more comfortable with Microsoft Teams. Um, and so, you know, I'm trying to look at it as um, a, a growth opportunity. Um, and um, it's, I think what it's really made me reflect on is just uh, the importance of having those conversations um, as a family um, and getting input, um, you know, from the children as well. Um, you know, they're young gamers, um, they're uh, tech neophytes in some ways, but in some ways uh, my 11-year-old son is, is faster um, with the tech than I am. Um, and so I think I need to, I think we need to have some humility. I need to have some humility. <laughs> um, and um, also, 
um, just thinking about, you know, for example, as my son goes over to a friend's house, I may have certain rules for this household about gaming, but when he goes over to a friend's house, um, there may be a whole other set of gaming mm. rules. And uh, I, we need to get more comfortable, I think, intra-family as we live in pods and work in pods to say, hey, um, what are your rules of the road? Um, and that should just be a very, hopefully, natural conversation um, and a normal conversation um, and recognizing that we're all in this together. Um, and um, I guess that's my key takeaway and just that you know what, you do need to spend a bit of time learning these different technologies. I think the good news is, is that so many companies are offering the tools and they are working really hard to make them uh, intuitive, to make them easier to find. Um, I failed to mention in the new Xbox consoles that um, right in the quick start, we have um, just a guide on how to set up the controls so that right in the line of the setup now, it's right there. Um, but that doesn't mean um, online safety is going to be auto-magical. Um, we all have to put a little bit of sweat equity into it. Um, but but there's so much there that can help us as parents. That's great. Thanks, Caroline. Alicia? I, I kind of want to answer this question based on research that I did before coming to Google. So um, and right. um, I hope that some of you will stay to the end of the conference today to hear my former colleague, Sonia Livingston, and I wrote a book together that she'll be talking about in the last session today called Parenting for Digital Future. And one of the things that came out so clearly in that research was actually that, you know, there's a lot of reporting about, you know, families kind of all separately in their different rooms in the house, you know, on devices. And that's really, you know, causing all this kind of social division. But actually, when we sort of sat down and we spent a lot of time like sitting on people's living room floors, drinking a lot of cups of tea because this was London and we were, <laughs> that's what you do when you go do family interviews. And um, and really, families talked about that, yes, sometimes they did feel isolated and they felt like they couldn't get their kids' attention because they were, you know, too busy like texting their friend or on social media. But actually, a lot of families talked about how media was this space of togetherness, whether it was like watching the show or playing a mm. game or you know, even like old fashioned things like going to the movies, which we now can't do, but there's, you know, substitutes for. And so in that sense, if there's one thing that makes me a little optimistic about this period of time during the pandemic is that recognition that um, actually this is a kind of a crucial way that we maintain our social ties and that actually that human element, you know, we interviewed several families who's, um, who had children with various kinds of disabilities, but including ADHD or autism spectrum disorders. And for those families, those parents often it was like cuddling up together on the couch and kind of like having that physical closeness that was really like super important to them. And that really happened only when they were, you know, watching a show together or playing on a tablet together. So I think it's important to recognize that like humanity, I think and it still is so much a part of how all of us engage with technology and, and trying to like assert that community in technology design and the way that we think about it. And, talk about it. And I think that all the folks at FOSI, I think, are excellent at kind of having that balanced understanding. But, you know, these days, particularly, it's very easy for parents to be very hard on themselves and also hard on their children. Like, oh, you've been on Zoom school all day, so I'm not going to let you play your game, you know, at the end of the day. But actually, we know that, you know, you're switching modes a lot there, that that playfulness, that game time, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that kids should be on screens 24 hours a day, but I do think that it's important to recognize that there's really different modes of engagement and kids kind of need a lot of a lot of all of the above um, and they need to be with their friends and if that is going to happen in roblox or minecraft or you know any number of other kinds of games and that is an important thing to figure out how to value during this time particularly that's great and very helpful Tony, did you have thoughts you wanted to share on this topic? Yeah, I think I think it's super interesting. If you, if you take it slightly slightly higher up the chain, I mean, we talk about education of the end user, which is great, and the engagement with the end user, which is fa uh, fabulous. We've seen, you know, in the, in the last few years, countries stepping in with regulation and legislation. In fact, Brent mentioned, you know, China's very different. Um, yeah, I just wonder whether each country is currently looking at this individually I, I, hmm. doesn't the world need to set some sort of base standard so that companies like microsoft and google and, and tencent who are creating great platforms for kids to be on um can actually have one set standard across the world so actually the engagement with the parent is and the education is slightly 
the same across the world and everybody every, everybody has that that one baseline because at the moment i think it's really challenging for vendors creating a service in this space you're going to do one thing in the mm -hmm. us another thing in europe you're going to have to treat kids in china in a different way and and you know then you've got to create all the messaging for parents around that and the engagement and the education of the different policies and regulations uh you know if we had a world trade organization for online safety where you kind of had that baseline across the entire world and brent's smiling here because he knows how challenging that would be yeah <laughs> I, I welcome it good luck i can, can yeah. you get back to me in a couple months with that <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? Can you give me a progress report in two months yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great <laughs> but yes together and, and kind of harmonized i like the sense well, of it though well, kind of building on that, um, you know, I think Caroline, you mentioned this earlier, the cooperation that's happening across industry. Like one of the questions we received from the audience uh, was, uh, are there any interesting synergies that the that you all are seeing across companies trying to solve family safety problems? So, so Tony, you mentioned maybe like a, a policy or you know, like maybe a trade association standard. Like to what extent are we kind of hitting that? maybe reaching that, that end goal with the, the greater collaboration and synergies out there at the moment. Whoever would like to, to share, like maybe exciting uh, collaborations or synergies you've seen in your work amongst uh, the different industry players. Yeah, you know, I would I would just say I uh, echo Tony's sentiments and observations. Um, having harmoni harmonization um, would be wonderful. Um, I, I'm all for stretch goals, um, and um, on the collaboration front, you know, a, a, f a fairly recent example is um, you know, were a member of a video game association called the Entertainment Software Association. Um, and that group recently started a new working group. It's called the Trust and Safety Working Group. And the idea behind this new working group is to have the member companies of ESA, you know, which, which range from the three console makers to the Walt Disney Company to EA, um, all come together um, with a regular cadence to actually share insights, have a speaker series on different topics um, related to trust and safety, and, and that includes um, diversity and inclusiveness, not just the more maybe immediate uh, thinking around what safety might mean, um, but making gaming welcoming for everyone. Um, and so while I can't think of any immediately immediate things that have come of that yet, it's the, mm. it's the beginning, and it's another end to have that collaboration, to share those insights, to share best practices, um, and to continue the momentum around safety not being um, a competitive differentiator, but something that we can all benefit just, from. I, I mentioned the Technology Coalition earlier and the work that we did to relaunch on Project Protect in June, but just to give a little bit um, more information and also a couple plugs around that work. So. I, obviously, that had been an industry group that had existed for some time, but we really wanted to kind of up-level the work and visibility. So we are actually in the process of hiring for an executive director. If anyone in the audience wants to apply or knows a great candidate, we're in, literally interviewing as we speak, so not too late. All right. And then we really great plug. To get a great, you know, experienced leader in that role, just helping us continue to come together. Another kind of upcoming initiative there is that part of the work is to really invest in research to increase our understanding of of the issue of child sexual abuse and exploitation because there is still so much that we don't know as an industry and as a society around what contributes to this um, kind of work you know like what you know what contributes both sorry successfully to this kind of work but also to the problem space you know what are effective messages for children what are kind of effective interventions so we actually will be soon, um, we have been working with the End Violence Against Children Partnership and we'll be soon launching a request for proposals. So um, the website's gonna be live in the next couple of weeks. Actually, may sorry, it may already be live now as the sort of save the date. And then the, the open call will start in January. And we are looking for proposals. They are all research-based, but they can come from practitioner organizations or educators. Again, if anyone here is interested in applying and we're looking at, you know, research that can help us as an industry understand effective interventions, 
um, you know, understand the problem space, understand what kinds of platforms are being used and how they interrelate with one another, understand how changing and evolving technology impacts this problem space and beyond. So, um, so that will be live in January on the end violence, um, on the environment's website. And if anyone's interested, we can add you to the mailing list so you can be kept up to date. That's great. Lexi, Brent, do you have anything to add on the synergy space and maybe ways the industry as a whole can kind of come up with common solutions and share best practices? Um, sure. I mean, we we are also just like the others were members of our own. We were members of the online dating association. We also, uh, you know, we collaborate with other um, dating apps who <laughs> it, it, it deal with a lot of the same issues as we do with safety. Um, and that's been a good resource for us and just, yeah, to be able to bounce ideas off each other and come up with best practices for the industry. Um, I do think that it's a really wonderful thing to be able to do as an industry um, to promote safety. <clears throat> that's great. Brent, did you have a thought? Not, not a lot. I, I mean, I think for us, it's, you know, we're, we're not, we're not in a U.S. company. Um, I think for us, the sort of collaboration, you know, well, I, I'm doing this talk right now. Um, you know, we started working with Fossi, uh, you know, we joined ESA. And so, uh, you know, sort of extending ourselves beyond, uh, you know, the beyond China and, and starting to be more active in, in, in talking about policy issues, which, you know, one are, obviously, I think, global. Um, and, 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 and two, you know, but, you know, there's also different experiences, right, that we can bring to the table for whether it's China or other parts of Asia, um, where, where, where that's kind of our home base. Um, and so, you know, we're just trying to, to be more internationally active and, and do more uh, policy discussion interaction. Gotcha. Yeah, it's inter interesting thoughts, one and all. Thank you. So we have about, oh, five or so minutes left. Um, there's one final question, which maybe we can wrap up here. And I thought it was an interesting one because it sort of gets at the, the trade-offs inherent in uh, kind of safety services and then accessibility. So this question was, you know, coming from, sounds like a, a parent, you know, could you comment on parental controls across different platforms? Like, is there a way to unite them? You know, school posts on Microsoft Teams, but then educational videos on YouTube, but Google Chromebook, kids profile only allows their child to watch kids YouTube, so we have to switch to an adult device. And I think that kind of gets at that tension, right, of, you know, making uh, content accessible in, in this case, but then uh, ensuring safety for the, for the user. So, um, Tony, you know, since uh, you don't get to share as much last last round of questioning, I don't know if you have any thoughts on kind of that that making those trade off decisions as a you know advisor or, or company. It is complex, isn't it? It is in a in a household. You, you know, if you count up your connected devices and look at the the range of connected devices from gaming to webcams or, or toys that are connected. Right. Hardware, yeah, you, yeah. You, know, you can talk a little bit about hardware there too, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's complex of how you'd actually implement uh, a parental control across all the different platforms. I mean, as a company like us, we can provide software for the, the platforms that will run the parental controls. But the mm. problem is, is you then step into a connected toy that has a differing, yeah, a differing platform, maybe doesn't have a full OS, it's running off a of firmware, it, run, yeah, it runs in a different right. way. So it's, it's very confusing for parents. You know, the one thing I would say is you know, parents need to step up and, and anything that's connected, they need to be looking for the vulnerabilities and the, and the things that are wrong with those devices. That's what actually search engines are really good for, is mm. to look uh, and doing your research about anything that's connected to your network. But it, you know, wouldn't it be great if it could be joined up and there was some commonality in actually making parental controls, having an API in all of these devices or some sort of feed, so that actually you could control them centrally. But mm. I think um, a bit like my harmonization of privacy policy across the world or whatever, <laughs> yeah, I think that's, 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 a, that's a big goal to ask and probably many years away. So it's a North Star. And I like how you added a very you know, practical tip. You know, search, use a search engine and look, look up how to do it or maybe the options there. So I don't know if any other panelists have uh, thoughts on this question and maybe a practical tip to leave the audience with. 
Um, I think, I mean, you, you raised even like within the Google world, right? There's Google Classroom and you may have an education yeah. account and then you have Family Link and that's, you know, your personal account. Um, so I think that's certainly a space that we, you know, particularly feel like that's, you know, identity is often a really hard thing to design for because there's so many different like shapes and sizes of users and, and needs. Um, but that's definitely an area that we've been, you know, working to kind of rethink those experiences and identity, particularly from the ground up. So we can certainly more to come on that. That's great. Yeah, and I, I, gosh, if there's one takeaway from today's conference, I think we will all be, you know, walking away with it saying, gosh, we heard from the research and we've heard from so many um, that it is still really challenging and that parents would really value you know, fewer places to go um, and making it even easier and quicker. Um, so, you know, that's really important. And um, I'm sure that we will all be talking about this and working on, you know, how do we continue to improve um, going forward. On the, on the Teams um, reference, I just wanted to put in a little bit of a plug. Um, for our virtual booth later this afternoon at 5 o'clock, we will have some of our education um, specialists who will be um, talking about Microsoft Teams in the education space and what some of the safety offerings are um, that are, are built into Teams. So if you want to learn more about that's that, that's Sounds a like a helpful opportunity. Lexi or Brent? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, we can wrap up about here. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing uh, your stories, insights, and your different products and services. Uh, there's a lot to unpack, and I hope uh, folks in the audience walk away with uh, practical applications that they can share with their communities. So thanks for letting me be your moderator, and for everyone for joining this session today. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.